story. I'm really hoping that my story will encourage suicide awareness. On February 21st, 2020, at one in the morning, the phone rang and woke me up out of a deep sleep. The voice said, look at your phone. Your son just sent us a suicide message. Which son? Who is this? It was my younger son's friend from California. I said, read me the text message. It was simple and clear and definitely him. I went into survival mode. Click on find friends, see where he was. My son Mark had joined his older brother as he was traveling in Arizona. They had spent a couple of days at the Grand Canyon and had traveled to Tucson to go bird watching. I could see his phone by the I-10 freeway. I called my older son and when he didn't answer his phone, I called the closest hotel to where my son's phone was. I told him, my son just sent a suicide message and I need to find him. He said, something has happened on the freeway. I think there might have been an accident and my heart sunk. I sent my older son a message. Your brother sent a suicide message. He called and he said, what are you talking about? I just left him at the hotel. We were joking and laughing. He was the happiest I have ever seen him. My heart sank even more. Those words, the happiest I have ever seen him. I knew what those words meant. His suicide was impulsive and shocking. And I've no doubt he made sure that we did not pick up on it and what he was thinking because he knew if we did, we would do all we could to make sure he was safe. My mind raced back to 2010. 10 years earlier, my kind, sweet son in the prime of his life developed schizoaffective disorder bipolar type at 22 years of age. He'd been working full time, living on his own for four years, as is common for someone who's in the beginning of an illness, who's refusing help and not yet in treatment. He was hallucinating, hearing a voice, lost touch with reality, became disconnected, and could no longer tell what was real. He developed a fixed delusion, and this was his reality to the day he died. He thought the devil was going to put him in power to kill millions of people. Despite his delusions and odd thoughts at that time, he continued to work, refused help, and was not meeting the criteria to be hospitalized. I was so frightened, seemingly like I was just waiting for the very bad to happen. His thoughts were, I'm a good person, and I don't want to be used in this way. And this resulted in three very public suicide attempts due to his psychosis in 2010 within three months. After his first suicide attempt, he was hospitalized and started on medications. He was attending the partial hospitalization program and trying to return to work. I actually thought at that point, the hard part was over. He would go back to his life now because he's on meds and in treatment. But the truth was the hard part was just beginning. The second attempt, he had a detailed suicide plan that did not work. We found out about it and was told to get him to the hospital. In hindsight, we now know if someone actually has a plan, it's really wise for the police to safety transport them. As my husband was walking him to the emergency room, he ran to the top of the four-story parking garage, teetering on the ledge for four hours in a very psychotic state. The police, thankfully, were trained negotiators and were able to inch their way closer and closer to him over the course of that time and grab him and bring him to safety. Once inside the local hospital, my older son visited him. After his visit, he said, Mom, if they let him out, he's going to kill himself. I knew there was no choice but for him to go into a psychiatric hospital for long term safety and stabilization. And ever since that time, I knew every day I spent with him was a gift. I started reaching out to all the local mental health agencies to learn as much as I could and found out that the local NAMI called NAMI Mid-Hudson offered free classes and support groups to those living with a mental health condition and their families. I took a free evidence-based class called Family to Family. I couldn't believe a class like that existed. It changed my life. It was taught by other family members who also had a loved one with a mental health condition. I no longer felt alone and learned there is help and hope. It was just what my family needed. 
We were exhausted physically, emotionally, and financially. And then we learn it's not a sprint, but a marathon. So it's really important to take care of our physical and mental health. They helped us gain knowledge about the local resources. And I learned communication and problem solving skills. They were guilt busters, helping my husband and I to understand this is an illness and not anyone's fault. We also learned about the predictable stages of emotional response that we were feeling. We were now prepared with a crisis plan. So when he went into crisis, we no longer were. It really helped my husband with his frustration of being an auto mechanic, taking anything apart and fixing it, but he couldn't fix his son. We felt empowered and better equipped to be able to advocate for him. I was so grateful for that class. I really felt it gave us our lives back. And in 2012, my husband and I both became certified family to family teachers. And I still teach that class to this day. It feels good being able to give back to other families in the community. And the comments that I receive from those families that I teach really help me in moving forward. One family who graduated the class wrote, we're amazed at your inner strength and continued positive life spirit, demonstrating how to survive a personal tragedy with grace and courage. My son was evaluated in the psychiatric hospital by a neuropsychiatrist who said he presents himself well, tends to minimize his symptoms and had a Pollyanna outlook. This was just like Mark. He never complained and always tried to stay positive and told everyone I'm fine. This doctor said it would be best for him to go into housing for supervision as he felt deep down he was still suicidal. But Mark assured me he was not gonna to try to kill himself again because he didn't wanna end up in the hospital. I knew these words translated into, if he did decide to end his life again, he would make sure. And then he would say, I'm just gonna to have to just let them take me over and let the bad things happen. I can't even imagine how it must have felt for him each night to lay there thinking those thoughts. We had a safety plan that we reviewed regularly with him and he knew any time he needed to, he could come over with his cat to my house for a few days. Mark truly did not think he was ill and his delusions were real. The term for this is anosognosia, which means to not know illness. The book, I'm Not Sick, and Don't Need Help by Dr. Amador was so helpful in teaching me that LEAP method of communication with him so I can keep a connection and help him stay in treatment and do what he needed to do despite the fact he didn't think he was ill. I had done my due diligence as a mom. I helped him navigate his new path to housing, his mental health program, care manager, made sure he continued to sign his voluntary AOT or assisted outpatient treatment every six months at his treatment team meeting and made sure he had a psychiatrist and therapist that he trusted. At times I would write a letter to everyone on his treatment team to alert them to my concerns if he became more symptomatic. I know that when someone is suicidal, it doesn't mean they always will be. So I often wondered when I did this, if I was being overprotected as maybe the danger had passed. In the beginning of his journey, I would get shivers and goosebumps every time the professionals would ask him if he was having thoughts of suicide or thinking of himself. I thought it would put the thought in his head again, but studies show this question does not put the thought in their head or increase their risk. It's actually like throwing somebody who's drowning a life preserver. And they're actually relieved that somebody realizes how much they're struggling and how really bad they're feeling. Despite that, it took me three years to get comfortable with that question. And I also learned if somebody answers yes to that question, how important it was to ask them, have you thought about how or when you would end your life? And if they do have a plan, they need immediate attention. I only remember asking Mark that question twice. I liked and preferred being his mom and as much as I could creating a safe, warm, loving environment and leaving as much as I could to the professionals. I advocated for him, educated myself and did whatever it took for him to live a safe, happy life and his best life despite his changed circumstances. Over the years, there have been hard times and good times but through it all, we've embraced humor as healthy. Early on, he decided to do an experiment to see if he really needed his meds. Thankfully, he concluded that even though he didn't think he was sick, he realized he couldn't function without them and they helped his paranoia. 
I always took the extra step, fast forwarding, so that if something did happen, I could go on. In the beginning years when his risk of suicide was high, some nights I would lay in bed and be worried and get up and drive the 45 minutes each way to check on him. And other nights I decided I was just gonna go to sleep. I realized it was not possible to be with him 24 seven. And as his parents, we could only do our best. I am though really glad in the airport before he left for that trip that I went over a safety plan with him. Most crisis we were able to handle outside of the hospital and only once did he have to go back in for a crisis. Sometimes he was taking his meds and they stopped working, which caused him to make poor decisions. And I learned at those times when he's making the worst decisions is when he needed me the most. He was in a nice routine and was able to find some independence and also had a healthy dependence on us as we assisted him. It took a community to keep him engaged in life. In the last few years, he had a caring doctor who was also like a life coach. He had a full recovery plan that included not only a medication regimen, but exercise, diet, and socialization. Every Friday, Mark would volunteer at Meals on Wheels, see his therapist who he trusted. He was an active participant in his groups when he attended his program called Pros, played his guitar in a wonderful band, and had fierce ongoing ping pong, bowling, and miniature golf tournaments with his father, uncles, and friends. He was an avid Xbox gamer known as Chimp to his online friends with a reputation for playing for fun, never trash talking or getting angry. I would always tell people he's doing the best he ever has, but he's still really sick. I've never had someone close to me die. We flew to Arizona to bring our son home. My brother came with us to drive back with my older son and my sister-in-law was our driver and sounding board. I wondered, would this break us? Would our marriage survive? We had been his caregivers over the last 10 years and I wondered how would I fare without him? He was my daily partner in board scrabble, my husband's haircut buddy, Yankee fan partner, tennis and ping pong competitor. As the grief came in waves and the different emotions surfaced, we decided to really let the feelings come and not push them away or cover them over, but sit with them and feel them. We decided this because we learned from past traumatic events associated with his psychosis, that if we push them away, they were gonna eventually surface and have to be dealt with anyway. We took advantage of the local trauma team and had debriefing sessions, which helped us process what had happened. My husband and I not only felt grief, but trauma and sadness associated with watching him suffer for so long. The grief process is so different for everyone. Each of us did what we needed to do to move on. And it was different even for each family member. My older son decided to remember him as he left him laughing and joking in that hotel room. In that last text message Mark had sent, he told his brother this had nothing to do with him. This helped my older son to not feel guilty and as horrible as this was for him, he felt relief that his brother's torture and suffering were over. But despite that, suicide is devastating. He still grieves as his heart is broken and he misses his brother terribly. He is glad though he can reflect on their last four days together. They were filled with laughter, reliving old memories, listening to good music, eating great food, and excitedly planning their next travel adventures together. My family of four was now three. We reflected on what would have happened if 10 years earlier he had ended his life. We're at the beginning of our journey then. We would have had many what ifs, no knowledge of what the next 10 years would hold, and the three of us felt like we would have been broken and destroyed and our grief journey would have been very different. For those who are grieving from the loss of someone, remember the process is unique to all of us. There's no right or wrong and each of us has our own healing timeframe. We feel our marriage of 40 years is stronger than it has ever been and we're bonded by this harrowing experience. Our families arrived in town for Mark's memorial service, which was held on March 7, 2020 at one of his favorite places to walk, Locust Grove in Poughkeepsie. There were over 400 people there. A beautiful sight as those attending reflected his love of orange in some way. And thankfully nobody got COVID from that gathering. <laughs> Everyone left on Sunday and there my husband and I sat all alone. We decided we would both return to work the next day. My husband fixes cars. 
but what would happen with me? I present Ending the Silence, a powerful in-person presentation for middle and high school students. And part of that presentation is talking about suicide, the warning signs, and how to get help for the students or a friend who's struggling. I had three Ending the Silence presentations that week. And as soon as I started presenting, I knew I would be okay. What I was teaching, I believed with my heart and my soul, and I had said it a thousand times, and now it resonated with me more than ever. Suicide is complicated and not caused by one event, big or small, but usually by a mental health condition that prevents the person from thinking clearly and rationally. No one should feel guilty if they lost a loved one to suicide. We can only do our best. The end result does not lie with us and even professionals don't know sometimes when somebody is thinking about suicide. Many times suicide can be prevented by seeing warning signs, but not always. Sometimes it is very impulsive. As I was presenting in the school on March 13th, the administrator came in and announced the school along with the world was closing down due to COVID. Our lives had just completely changed with the death of our son but now so would everyone else's. To me, it felt like all of a sudden, everyone had a son with schizoaffective disorder. People were living on edge, scared all the time, not knowing what was coming next and living with constant uncertainty. These all too familiar feelings were what I had experienced over the last 10 years. My heart goes out to those who have lost a loved one in any way, but especially during COVID, when the funeral homes were full, and it wasn't possible to gather for a funeral or a memorial service. I was so grateful we were able to have that memorial service for Mark. If it had been a week later, we would have had to cancel it. COVID made it possible for me to work from home, have a slower pace to take the time I needed to figure out how I would move forward. Some things had noticeably changed. My first thought upon waking was no longer, is Mark okay? and then making a plan for what I would do if I didn't hear from him by a certain time. And the constant worry and fear of what would happen to him if something happened to me was gone. One family who had lost their son years earlier reached out and said, moving forward is not bad. It's just very, very different. I finally felt I was ready to connect with others who had a similar experience and just recently started attending a family surviving suicide loss support group, which has been helpful. I also felt I needed to separate grieving at the cemetery and being able to focus on happy memories. We put a happy memory rock with a plaque that's visible from our kitchen windows in the backyard. It's surrounded by orange, color, orange flowers. I love looking at it. And as I drink my coffee every morning, I think of our fun times and all the laughter that we shared. I think of his brave long battle and how I wish he was still here today. I admire Mark for his modesty, his kindness to everyone. He was so gentle and had a pure heart and I'm proud of him and proud of others who continue to do the best they can to live their life despite their struggles. I always felt he deserved a medal for courage. And I often tell that to my young adults who I work with who tell their story to help others in our Ending the Silence program. For those struggling with thoughts of suicide, keep fighting. Life is a precious gift and we prefer you here with us. Suicide is devastating. So take advantage of the resources provided here today. A heartfelt thanks to all supported him and my family, especially whoever was part of his treatment team at any point during his long journey. We move forward with a hole in our hearts and fond memories. Our bonfires will never be the same without him here strumming his pleasant sounding music on his guitar or leading a sing-along. Being a caregiver to my son, Mark William Robert Brown was a pleasure, my sweet boy. For now, we cherish the memories and hold on to our faith and hope. Thank you for listening to my story. <laughs>